class of this study of the book of Revelation. I want to welcome everyone who's watching right now live stream uh, via the church live stream. Thank you for joining us. I know that there will be people that will be watching this in the future on tape delay. I want to welcome you guys. And um, so you, you guys have heard me say uh, many, many times, if you're a regular here at the church, you've heard me say that we are an end times remnant church. That is what God has called us to. This is, I don't know what's going on with this, Greg, but it's, yeah, it's, it's getting a little carried away. Um, you've heard me say that we're an end times remnant church, and that's exactly what the mandate that the Lord has put on us. I do believe that we're living in the, in the end times. And I believe that God has called us to be a remnant church. And one of the things that's very important, if we're an end times church, we really need to know what the word of God tells us about what's going on and what's going to happen in the end times. And that's why we've made it just, uh, uh, we've decided to do this class. We've been advertising it for a while and I'm excited for it. Um, I said this Sunday morning, I'm a student of the word. I like to learn. I want, and I've known Pastor Art and his wife, Carolyn, for probably close to 30 years. Um, I first met them in, well, I'm, maybe not 30 years, but I met them in 1999. And their two youngest children were both in my youth group. And now they're all grown up and have their own kids, and, and which makes me feel really, really old. But um, I, I've said this before, and I, and I, want, I want you to understand this. When I tell you this, this is not something that I'm saying to try to butter up Pastor Art. And first of all, I don't butter up anybody, okay? That's not in my nature. But um, Pastor Art has been studying eschatology for a very, very long time. And I've been fortunate enough. He has actually at times loaned me some of his study material. And, man, I'm telling you, I took those things home, and I just, like a sponge, and, and I'm, when I say study material, I'm talking like just one chapter, a notebook on one chapter that is just broken down in the way that, it, that it's taught and explained is just phenomenal. So you guys are in for a huge treat uh, for this teaching. Each one of our classes are probably going to go for about an hour, no more. You know, we don't want anybody to get worn out and we don't want Pastor Art to get worn out, but... Um, I do want to ask you now, before we pray and turn it over to Pastor Art, if you have your cell phone on you, would you please uh, put it on mute, turn it down, put it on vibrate, something like that. Um, that way we don't have any interruptions in the class. We would greatly appreciate that, all right? And um, we're going to bow and open up in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Art. So if you want to come on up. Father, we love you, and we love your word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It guides us. It's, our, it's the manual of life. And, Lord, we know that we are living in the, in the end times, in the last days, and we're hungry to, uh, to know more about you, to know more about your word. And I just pray, Lord, as, as Pastor Art begins this series tonight and, and continues to teach it weekly, Lord, I pray that as we listen and we learn that you would just give us revelation on this book of Revelation that you would just open our eyes to anything. It, it, it is a tricky book for those who have not studied it, but Lord, your Holy Spirit will give revelation as we study this. And I, I ask, Lord, for your continued anointing on Pastor Art as he teaches, not just tonight, but every week. And may our ears just be able to take in and, and understand and, and grow everything uh, from, from what we learn as we go through this study. And I ask it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. It's so good to see so many of you out. I'm overwhelmed. And I'm highly honored to have this uh, privilege of teaching you the book of Revelation. This is an awesome responsibility. And uh, to tell you the truth, I feel very inadequate for the task because this is, a, this is such an awesome book. It's so majestic. We see Christ in such a glorious way, his majesty, his power, his glory, it's on display in this book. This is his book, it's his revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus. And I hope you're going to get to know him 
in a way that you've never seen them before. But uh, this is a challenging book, and uh, I have uh, some requests I'd like to make of you. Before you come each week, I'd like you to make sure you read the book. Read, read chapter. We're going to be in chapter one for at least three, maybe four weeks, just in chapter one. There's so much here that uh, I, I just feel uh, it uh, important to take our time to go through this book. I know everybody is uh, anxious uh, about what's going to happen in the future. What are we in store for? All about the Antichrist, all about the tribulation. You want to know when the next, <coughs> the next uh, great event is going to occur? And uh, there's so much about the future. That's what this whole book is. Most majority of this book is about the future. And uh, everybody wants to peer into the darkness to know what lies ahead. That's just human nature. Well, we're going to discover what God has to say about his plan to take back what Satan has stolen from him. And he's going to come back in the future. He's coming just as certain as I'm standing here tonight. They say that there's only two things in life that's uh, certain. That's death and taxes. But I have news for you. There's a third thing. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen? Amen. So when you come to these sessions, I'd like you to bring your Bible Everybody should have a Bible of some kind. I, you can have an electronic Bible. That's all right with me. But make sure you have a Bible. And bring a notebook with you. You want to take some notes. And then read the book. That's the most important thing. Read it. Don't have to read a lot ahead. Just so you read each chapter before you come to these sessions. I'd appreciate that immensely. The book of Revelation you're going to discover is a different kind of a book. Have you found it so? Now, I know that you can go to certain books of the Bible and find things in, for example, the book of Daniel or the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zechariah, that seem and sound very similar to things that we're going to discover in the book of Revelation. Well, they were prophets. They were great prophets of God, and they spoke about the future. And so it's only natural that we're going to discover some things that they said in the book of Revelation because they were looking down through history to the end of time, and they were being having these visions and dreams. God was revealing to them his plan for the future. And so we find certain things in those books that we find in Revelation. Also, we find in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are three very important books because in them we find the, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, in Mark chapter 13, and in Luke chapter 21. In these three chapters, you'll find recorded the Olivet Discourse. And this is, uh, uh, this is a subject that has been debated down through the centuries. But don't let that scare you. I want you to read those chapters. Study them. Meditate upon them. Because Jesus is speaking in those chapters. Just like he's speaking to us in the book of Revelation. And he had three of his disciples that came to him. And they asked him, Lord, when will these things be? And what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus took time to respond to their question. He didn't put them off. He didn't say, well, I don't have time to answer that question. He took the time and he patiently went through a whole series of signs and events that are to transpire during the course of history, leading us up to the very end of time and the last days. We are living in those last days. We are seeing many of the things that he predicted and prophesied about. We are seeing them take place right before our very eyes. So... Many Christians have looked at this book 
and uh, they've been intimidated by it. They've been, they've been afraid to even, even approach it or study it or meditate upon it or preach from it. Uh, it was only a, maybe two or three years ago that I was talking to a, a pastor. And we were discussing the book of Revelation. And he said, well, you know, he said, I've been in the ministry for almost 40 years, and I've never once preached a sermon from the book of Revelation. Now, I tell you, folks, that I don't mean to be critical, because I think that that is very often the case in many churches today. They have not been taught about the end times. They have not been taught from the book of Revelation. In fact, they haven't been taught anything when it comes to the last days. But uh, people have all kinds of, of opinions about this book, and that's why many people have shied away from it. Some people look at the book of Revelation and they say it's just a book of riddles. Strange riddles. Nobody can understand them. Others say it's just a lot of fantasy. Others have made the statement that it's just the gibberish of an old man who had sunstroke on the Isle of Patmos because he was worked too hard and he was exposed to too much sun and he was having delusions of the mind. All these kinds of statements have been made about the book. And you know, uh, what's even worse than that is that there have been many godly men who've made statements about this book that have caused people to shy away from it. How many of you have heard of Martin Luther? Great man of God, one of the great reformers of the church. He uh, introduced or brought back to light the doctrine of salvation by faith. The just shall live by faith and faith alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And that swept across the known world and had brought about great reformation in the church of Jesus Christ. And so I certainly commend him for his introducing this doctrine back to the church again. But this same man wrote and said, it's a pity that this book of Revelation ever made its way into the New Testament because he did not understand it. He could not comprehend it. And he was mystified by it. And so he belittled it, those that taught it, those that preached it. And yet a man by the name of William Barclay said these words, it is infinitely worthwhile to wrestle with until it gives its blessing to us and opens up its riches. Others have said this book is beautiful beyond description. Someone said it is a masterpiece of pure art. And so the question is, uh, what, what, who do I believe? Who do I put my trust in? I might remind you, too, that Satan has his opinion about this book. He hates this book. He loathes it. He's going to do everything in his power to keep you from reading it. He does not want you to look at it and understand it. And the reason he doesn't want you to understand it is because it tells us about all the mischievous things that he's been up to down through the centuries of time, diabolical things. And furthermore, he does not want you to know what it has to say about his destiny, his destruction, his... This book tells us that there's coming a day when the Lord is going to take him and cast him into a bottomless pit and he's going to be there for a thousand years, sealed in, not able to deceive the nations any longer. That will be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when he's down here on this earth reigning as Lord of Lords and King of Kings.
Yes, he has his opinions, but they don't amount to much. If you're a child of God and you know what his destiny is, because even after he's released from that thousand-year pit, he's only going to be allowed to go through the ends of the earth for a very short period of time as he gathers an army to make war upon the holy city and gather his forces around the holy city. Fire is going to come down out of heaven and consume him, his armies, and he is going to be cast into the lake of fire along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. That's where he's going to spend eternity. But you know, I don't really care too much about what other people have to say about this book. I certainly don't care about what Satan has to say about this book. But I do care for what God has to say about this book. And I want you to look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Verse 3 simply says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. Blessed, blessed is the one that reads the words of this prophecy. I, I, I want you to th just think on that for a moment. Now, <laughs> I know that there's a blessing from reading other portions of God's Word, but there's a special blessing here for you, for me. In a special way, God says He's going to bless the one that, now that ought to be motivation if there any, ever anything is. I like getting blessed, don't you? Amen? Now, uh, just in case your mind goes there, well, does that mean he's going to get me a new car like he did for Stephen over here? Does that mean like he's going to bless me with a new house, a new wife, new girlfriend, new whatever? I don't want you to think that I'm going to get into uh, teaching that prosperity gospel. That's not my intention, whatever. God has promised that he'll bless us, and he has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in high and heavenly places. We are actually even seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's the glorious position that we occupy right now. Right now. He's already blessed you. As we read and study this prophecy, we're going to be blessed to socks right off of us. Now, I also need to tell you something else, though. I want you to go to the last book of, or the last chapter of this book. Go to Revelation uh, chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and look at, starting at verse 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city which are written about in this book. That's how much God thinks of his word. He says he'll bless you for reading it and studying it, meditating upon it, but he'll also curse you if you add to it and you take away from it. It's very important that we learn the the importance of God's Word, and how sacred, how holy it is. He says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. And God says what He means, and He means what He says. And we have to be very careful about adding to it our own opinions, our own speculations. Now, there are times when it's necessary to speculate because 
the sense just is too difficult to come at. We don't seem to understand it. We don't grasp it. And we look and we read from others and we pick their minds and get their input to it and then we speculate. But if I have to speculate about something, I'm going to tell you it's my purely my speculation. God has the final word at all times. And he'll bless you if you take forth, he says in Jeremiah the prophet, take forth the precious from the vile. And if you take forth the precious from the vial, you will then be as my mouth, he says. You speak the way I'm speaking. What about the interpretation of this book? How do we interpret it? Now, many will say, I'm a literalist. I say it. I believe in the literal interpretation of the Scripture. And whenever I possibly can, that's the way I want to understand it, in a literal fashion. But there are times um, when God speaks metaphorically. For example, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. If your eye offend, right eye offends thee, pluck it out. Well, I was afraid if we took him literally, we'd have a lot of one hand and one eyed people here tonight. So God expects us to use, uh, as someone once said, sanctified common horse sense. We have to use some common sense when we are looking at what the scriptures say. But some take this grossly literal, some take it grossly allegorical or metaphorical or symbolical. And I try to take the best of all these different schools of thought and try to come up with what I think makes the most common sense. Some scholars say that the book of Revelation is a sealed book. It's only to be understood by a few. Only those who are educated have to have a Ph.D. You know what that means, don't you? Piled high and deep, Ph.D. <laughs> Let me try to break down this book with the help of uh, some graphic arts and slides that my daughter, Terry Kinder, over here, she's... Uh, wants to make her dad look professional. And so she took a lot of time to develop these graphics. I, I, I was feeling sorry for her. I, I told her, are you sure you're going to have the time to do this? And she said, well, Dad, I have to put together a PowerPoint every single day of the week. She's a teacher. She teaches school. So I said, well, in that case, good. You can do this. That's great. So I want to try to break it down. You'll notice up on the, on the screen that this book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book. <laughs> it is also a symbolic book. And it is a historic book. And it is a prophetic book. All four of those are involved as we study this book. And, the, and today's lesson... Uh, uh, We'll be lucky if we get by 1 and 2 of chapter 1. We're not going to get very far because I'm going to give you an overview of the, of the whole book so that you know what you're getting yourself into. And uh, as I say, it's a, it's a complex book. But uh, I'm sure you're, you, you've come hungry. You've come thirsty. And he that thirsteth, after me, like, like the deer panteth after the water brook, so my heart panteth after thee, O God. Is your heart panting after the Lord? You really want to learn from his word? The book of Revelation in the New Testament has the literal title in Greek, the Apocalypse. And it was translated, the Bible was translated into the Greek language. And when this book 
was first printed in Greek, it had the, on the on the cover or on the heading of the of the book, it said the Apocalypse of Saint John. Now that word apocalypse simply means, in the English, it means revelation. It means uh, to uncover or to unveil, to make a full disclosure. And what we have here is the unveiling, a full disclosure of the Lord Jesus Christ and his plan for the ages, his plan leading up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that in the apocalypse. Now, I know when you think of apocalyptic things, uh, you, you think of um, the end of the world. You think of how the world is going to end, especially that it's going to come about suddenly or violently or catastrophically. We hear that word apocalypse being used more and more frequently as any time a war breaks out, oh, this is the leading up to the apocalypse, the coming of Christ or Armageddon. That's a familiar term, I'm sure. So when we think of the end of the age and the apocalypse, we are thinking of the end of civilization as we know it today. This book takes the lid off things. You see, that's what it means. It means literally to take the lid off so that you are allowed to peer in to see what the contents are inside of the barrel. Well, we're not talking about the barrel. We're talking about the plan of God. And it allows us to, this book allows us to look in and see what's uh, going on on the inside, on, uh, uh, behind the scenes, behind the, the stage, so to speak. And this book draws back the curtain. And it lets us see what is actually happening behind the scenes. And it tells us who really is in charge of things that are occurring on the earth here below. This information is vitally important. It is especially going to be important to people that are struggling with difficulty and hard times, being persecuted, under suffering, under attack by the enemy being martyred for their faith, people like that certainly benefit the most from a book like this. People who are going to suffer and are under the gun, so to speak, and they're enduring hardship and pressure, this book, God gave it as his revelation of his plan so that they could be relieved of fear so that they could be relieved of pressure, so that they could find hope in their struggle for survival. It was written to a church, churches that were under the gun, so to speak. It shows us that in spite of everything we see happening around us, the one that is really in charge of what's going on is seated in the heavens. He is seated upon his throne, and Jesus, his son, is seated by his right side. And he is cool and collective. He's not rattled. He's not shaken. He's not taken by surprise by any of the things that are going on here on this earth. Nothing takes him by surprise. He is alert to it all. He has it all under control. And uh, everything that's going on is leading us progressively, day in and day out, towards that ultimate goal when the Lord Jesus Christ shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of Almighty God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, he's in charge. 
This book of Revelation teaches us that Jesus is our king. He is the one that we serve. He's the one that we obey. He's the one that gives us our marching orders. He's the one that tells us what to do and when to do it. It's not the president. It's not any king. It's not any dictator. It's Jesus Christ, the sovereign God of our universe. He's in absolute control. Jesus said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And that's why he could say to his disciples, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. To the very end of the age. Jesus didn't say, oh, you poor things. You're going out into that cruel world, and you're going to have to suffer, and you're going to have to die. Oh, woe is me. Poor me. No, that's not what he said. He, he, he told them just the plain facts. He said, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of God doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Are you sure you want to follow me? He tells us the truth. But he, he prayed, when he prayed to his father, he said, Father, I pray that you take them not out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. We have a God that's able to keep us, a God that's able to preserve us, a God that's able to take us all the way through. We are so caught up in these physical bodies and trying to protect ourselves from harm and injury and death and suffering. But suffering is a part of the Christian life. It's part and parcel for all of us. We've got to expect if we're going to serve him. He said, if you, if you follow me, you're going, you're going to, they're going, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. So we've got to prepare ourselves. And I'm so glad that, that was the thing that more than anything was what motivated me to come and Joined with Second Chance Church. I came to visit one day, and Pastor Steve was preaching from Revelation. <laughs> Praise God. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I've been sitting in a church for so many years, and I've heard, I, I don't think I've heard of one sermon from the book of Revelation. I want to go where I can feel at home. I want to be a part of a church that has a vision for the lost, a vision for where things are moving in our nation and in our world, be a part of a movement that prepares people to face the difficult times in, tr in life. There's perilous times that are coming to our world. <coughs> Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, perilous times are coming. Men should be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, he said. Perilous times. Jesus warned us over and over and over again in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Watch and pray. Watch. We have to be on the lookout. Be alert to what's going on around us. Now, you may be aware that Jesus has more than one office. The book of Revelation presents Jesus as a king. He's, he's going to be, he's our coming king. Chapter 19 of the book of Revelation shows Jesus coming, a white horse at the head of an army of angelic beings, thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 of his mighty angels coming to execute judgment upon the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds. 
He's more than a king, though. He is our king, but he's also our high priest. How many of you knew that? Jesus is your high priest. And he's engaged in priestly duties, sitting at the right hand of the Father on high. He makes intercession for you and for me as a priest. He's our great high priest, and what a sacrifice he made once and once for all. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, having made that final sacrifice that was necessary for your atonement and for mine, our salvation. He is, a, he is our priest. And he's also a prophet. You see, we don't often think about Jesus as a prophet, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he is prophesying. He's telling the future. He's preparing us for his coming. And he wants us to know what is lying ahead. So when he comes... There are four things that I want to give you tonight. Four, there's many things that he's going to do, but we're going to, there's four storylines that we want, to, we want to follow. They're up on the, uh, on, on the board. He's coming for retribution. They'll all begin with R so that it helps me keep this brain of mine that kind of wants to go off in tangents at times, down rabbit trails. So if I alliterate, it brings me, keeps me in line a little bit. Retribution. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back in retribution, for retribution. What do we mean by that? Well, when you think of retribution, you, you think uh, in terms of of judgment or or wrath. Uh, let me see if I can give you a couple verses that kind of show what I mean. Go to Matthew chapter 24 and go to verse uh, 36. Matthew 24, 36. Now concerning that day and hour, it's speaking of his coming back. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. And this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. So when he comes back, he's coming back swiftly. He's coming back in judgment, just as it was in the days of Noah. Men and women were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and then suddenly, destruction came upon them. So this book tells us about that retribution. Look at 11, Revelations chapter 11. Revelation 11, and at chapter 11 at verse 18. It says, the nations were angry but your wrath has come. The time has come for, you, for the dead to be judged and to give reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. So when Jesus comes back, he's coming back in retribution. He's coming back to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the, and the dead. He's coming back to execute judgment upon all that are ungodly for their ungodly deeds, for the ungodly things that they have committed. Someone 
wrote a sermon one time. It was called Payday Someday. Payday Someday. Jesus said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. But we could take God at his word. He says it just the way it's going to be. God's word, everything that God has said or prophesied or predicted that is going to take place, it's going to take place just exactly the way that God said that it would take place. In other words, when, Jesus, or when God's word said that, that a Savior would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, it wasn't in Mexico or Yugoslavia, or in New York City. It was in, not in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania either. It was in Bethlehem of Judea. It was fulfilled just exactly the way God said it was going to happen. When God says it, you can take it to the bank. It's going to be the greatest day in all the world's history when God comes back to set up his kingdom. The second thing that I want you to note is that he's coming back to reward the saints. Why, you should be jumping up and down. You should be just praising God. He's going to reward you. All the things you've done for the Lord and for his kingdom. It doesn't matter if it's just been a glass of cold water. You give it to one of, to one of my children. He's, you've done it to me. He's going to bless you and reward you. Think of the Apostle Paul when he came to the end of his life. And he was about to be offered. Think of that. I, I, I mean, here's a man that paid the ultimate price. He gave his life. They chopped his head off. He's not sitting in that cell feeling sorry for himself. He picked up his pen and he wrote to Timothy and he says, Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness that I'm going to receive at that day and not unto me only, but unto everyone that's looking for his appearing. Are you looking for his appearing? He has a reward for you. There are at least five different crowns that he has to give to you. Crown of rejoicing, crown of praise, crown, the, the martyr's crown, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness. Not only that, he said to those that took their talents and invested them and made other talents, he said, be thou over ten cities. You be over five cities. You be over one city. He said, if you suffer with me, you will also reign with me. <laughs> what, what wonderful rewards God has in store. Paul said that the, what can compare? The sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is ours in Christ Jesus for serving the Lord. And so nobody noticed anything you've done. I'm getting tired of this. Nobody recognizes me. Nobody pats me on the back. Nobody gives me any praise. Jesus will give you praise. He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubt was come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Paul said, you are my reward. You are my reward. Brother Steve preaches his heart out week after week after week. And what's the reward, I'll tell you? Ye, you, you are his reward. He's being rewarded. He'll be rewarded. What time we have to end here? 7.30 or 7.30? Okay. 
He's coming to bring retribution. He's coming to reward the saints. And third, he's coming back to recreate, to re restore this world. Paradise lost, paradise gained. He's going to change this world and make it something like you've never dreamed or could possibly dream of. Paul in Romans says that the whole earth groans, waiting to be delivered, waiting to be good delivered for the adoption of redemption of these bodies and redemption of the world. And the, the world is under a curse since Adam. And Jesus is going to come back and he's going to change this world. When he gets through it, it's not going to look like the world that you and I are familiar with. It's going to be recreated and renewed. Read Romans 8. I forget the chapter verse. Well, maybe I can give it to you. <laughs> Romans 8.22. Romans 8.22. The fourth thing, and I've got to hurry, the fourth thing that he's going to do is he's going to set up his kingdom upon this earth. For 2,000 years, the church has been praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. You've been praying that? We used to pray that all the time in the churches years ago. Every time we met, Lord's Day. Now, very seldom hear it anymore. But it's such a truth, such a marvelous truth. We have been praying, and God answers prayer. And he's bringing his kingdom down here Heaven is coming to earth. Can you believe that? I mean, he's the only one that can change things. I hope you're not looking to Washington to change things for you. I hope you're not looking to any president to change things for you. I can tell you what you're in for. No matter what they promise us, they promise us peace, they promise us less taxes, keep us out of war, and then they never deliver on any of their promises, and I don't care what party they belong to. My prayer is, Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, as John prayed. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, because the only change that's ever going to really matter, that's going to matter or amount to anything is when the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom, and he reigns as king of kings and lord of lords over all the nations of this earth. All the kings of this earth are one day going to surrender their sovereignty to Jesus Christ, the King of kings. And every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of lords and the King of all kings. Hallelujah. Praise God, Jesus is coming back to clean up the mess and this is all sum, summed up for us in Revelation chapter 17. You can go there. Revelation 17 and at verse, I'll find it in just a minute. 1714. 1714. Let me start back at 13. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. That's the Antichrist. These will make war against the Lamb. That's Jesus. But the Lamb, Jesus, will conquer them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, 
Those with him are called, chosen, and faithful. He said it. I believe it. That settles it. <laughs> this sums up why we call Revelation an apocalyptic book. Because it is an unveiling of the future. The future retribution that's going to take place when Jesus Christ comes back. It's a disclosure of the reward he's going to bring with him. He says, I have my reward with me to give to you, to you who are faithful, to you who are obedient to me, to you, to those of you that followed me through the suffering, through the hardship, through the trials of life. Those of you that put your trust in me, I'll reward you. I'll reward you openly. And then he's going to renovate this world when he comes back. And he's going to reign triumphantly. And righteousness will flow from shore to shore, it says. Let me give you a, a, an Old Testament picture of this in, in, the, in the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. The vision that Isaiah, this is in, at verse 1, Isaiah chapter 2 at verse 1. The vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. And all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It'll go to the ends of the earth. Can you imagine? He's going to set up his kingdom. It's going to be set up in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. is going to be lifted up higher than all the other mountains. And there, if Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, is going to reign over all of creation, all the world. Hallelujah. 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 I got a few more minutes, so I, I guess I, I'll just plunge on, keep on keeping on. Now, that brings us to uh, another question. <clears throat> Who actually is the author of this book? Somebody? Well, uh, I, I, I'm sure that most of you would probably immediately say John. But it's not quite that simple who the author of this book is. Now, I grant you it comes from the pen of John. It came from his pen. He is that beloved disciple. He was the one that used to lay his head on Jesus' breast. Such an intimate relationship that he had with, with the Lord when he was here, when Jesus was here on the earth ministering. John was one of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John, very frequently, they are with Christ alone. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it was Peter, James, and John that took Jesus aside privately and they said, when shall these things be? And what's the sign of your coming? So <laughs> Jesus and John were very intimately involved with one another during his earthly ministry. And now he's out, stuck out in the middle of the Aegean Sea, about 25 miles off the shore 
of what is known today as modern day Turkey. He's out there in the Aegean Sea and he's a, a political prisoner of Domitian. He was put into exile. They wanted to get rid of the old man. He's 85 years old. That two days from today, I'm going to be 85 years old. Can you imagine? That poor old man is stuck out there on that island, working in the mines all day long. And then when he come home at, out of the mine, they march him into his stone house, and they chain him to the wall. He's out there in the Aegean Sea when he has this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was he out there? He was preaching the gospel. And because he was preaching the gospel and being faithful to his calling and his ministry, they said, we got to get rid of this rebel rouser. And at that time, Rome was in power, mighty, powerful nation, and they were oppressing the people of God. And Christians were hated by this dictator, Domitian. He wanted to get rid of all of them. There were like about 10 periods of distinct persecution that took place during his reign of terror. And they actually arrested John, and they, 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 tradition tells us they put him in a, a, one of these, not, not a golden calf, but it was a brass animal, a beast of some kind, and filled it with water, set that thing over a fire, and put John inside of it, and they were going to boil him to death. And he came out of it alive, unscathed. That's what tradition tells us now. I don't know if it's true or absolutely true. I can't, don't have ab, no Bible verses. I'm speculating now. Okay. But that's what I've been told. And because he couldn't get rid of them that way, they said, well, but let's banish him out there on Patmos where he'll be out of our hair and he won't be giving any more trouble, more sermons being preached in those churches that he's been shepherding. And so that's where he is physically. He's stuck on this island. He's physically there. And I've got to end in another minute or two. But that's where his mind was, or his, his body was. But where was his mind? I'll tell you, when I get away from home, my mind's on home. I want to be home. I want to be home. But... John's mind, I'll tell you where it was. It was in the Word of God. It was in the Word of God. How do I know that? Because, and, and, and you, can, you can check me out. You can fact check me now on this. There are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, and in those 22 chapters, there's 404 verses of Scripture. I counted them. I I. In my version, 404. Now, there's other versions that might be 403. And of those 404 verses of Scripture in this book, there are 400 allusions to the Old Testament Scriptures. And out of 39 books of the Old Testament, he quotes from 24 of those 39 books. That's how I know his mind was in the Word of God. He took the admonition that the psalmist give, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water to bring forth fruit in its season. That's where his mind was. His heart was back with the people there, 
in Turkey, those seven churches that he had walked among them and shepherded them and had preached in their churches. That's where his heart was. And his spirit, go to verse 10 of chapter 1. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day when suddenly the Lord shows up. Well, isn't that amazing? When you're in the spirit, the Lord often shows up. In fact, that spirit is in a capital S. If you look at verse 10, that his spirit, he said he was in the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. He's in the Holy Spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord's day, most of the commentators are in agreement about this. They seldom agree on everything, but they, they pretty much agree on this. That the Lord's day is the Lord's, the new Sabbath, Sunday, the first day of the week. They were celebrating the resurrection of the Lord on the first day of the week, and they began that practice right in the first century. Well, praise God. Thank you so much for your attention. You've been a good audience. You, But I didn't hear too many amens. <laughs> praise God. Well, do uh, you want to close us out. Okay, so uh, as Pastor R said tonight, this is kind of an opening of a, of a preview of the entire book. Next hey, week he's hey. going to start uh, in chapter one and work, and he'll be really breaking down everything. But uh, as he just told you, he's a couple days away from turning 85 years old, but he still has some fire. <laughs> Thank you, brother. And uh, he, he's w once a pastor, once a preacher, always a pastor, oh, yeah. always a preacher. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, I'm going to close out on a word of prayer. Uh, again, if for some reason, I know everybody has uh, a lot of schedules and everything like that. If you can't be here um, in person on a Tuesday night, you can watch it via live stream. If you can't watch it via live stream, every one of these teachings is going to be recorded and it will be uh, put, uh, we're actually creating, uh, Greg was telling me this tonight, he's creating um, a new section in our media. So there'll be a, a section specifically tabbed Revelation. Okay. So uh, now if you go to it, you, if you click on media, it'll say message archives, and that's all the messages from Sunday morning. But we'll be creating a new tab that will just strictly say Revelation. So if you miss a week, you can just click on Revelation, and you'll see it all there in, in order. Okay? So thank you, Pastor, for sharing tonight. And I'm excited about this. I'm telling you, I cannot say enough of how much juice, this is figuratively speaking, how much juice you're going to get out of each one of these, these verses as we study. Okay? Let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word that's living and active. And we thank you, Lord, for the hunger of everyone here tonight, those listening and watching on live. Uh, Lord, we just pray a hedge of protection on each one of us as we go home tonight, that you would just watch over us and protect us, um, bring us back here, whether it's prayer tomorrow night or Sunday morning in your house as we come to worship. And uh, we just thank you for it, Father. We ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.